Gentlemen. All right, welcome to Kabbalah and Coffee. This is our weekly get together where we study all things Kabbalah and coffee. I'm kidding about the coffee part. We don't study coffee, even if we might drink coffee. Um, we are going to talk about today a very important topic, actually, multiple very important topics, and advance our discussion inside our text, which is called Overcoming Folly. For those of you that are wondering what the book looks like you've probably seen it by now maybe you have a copy this is what the book looks like at least this is the original edition overcoming folly you can find it in uh, wherever good books are sold so i want to speak today i want to start off by talking about a phrase that's used in modern psychology and that phrase is metacognition metacognition what is metacognition or being metacognitive so here's, here's, the, uh, here's the idea. You know, we, we walk through life and there's a lot of stuff going on and we have a lot of feelings as we go through life. And oftentimes we're not even aware of, our, of, uh, of the feelings that we have until they're manifest in such a big way that they begin to like take over certain parts of our life. Like we might not feel that we're upset or angry about something or disappointed until it blows up into like a big expression of that emotion. Or we might not feel um, uh, angry about something until we blow up at someone and, and it's built on you know, pent up anger that has not been dealt with, et cetera. And so there's a lot of emotions. Here's my point. There's a lot of emotions that we feel as we go throughout our day, throughout our days, throughout our lives, throughout our, you know, th throughout our living that kind of lurk under the surface and we may not pay attention to it and not think about it too much until it rears oftentimes it's ugly head not that all emotions are ugly plenty of good emotions but vis-a-vis -vis the negative ones it doesn't do us that we don't do ourselves any favors by not noticing that we're having these negative emotions until it's too late so this is what's going on inside of us and the term metacognitive or metacognition is used today in modern psychology and especially in the in the field of of um of positive psychology to indicate this idea that not only are we you know having feelings but we're aware hey we're aware of the feelings that we're having so meta so cognition of course is awareness metacognition is being aware of our awareness and that helps us manage our emotions so let me give you a quick quick explanation when we experience a an instinctual reaction right somebody says something that we don't like and we get offended or we get disappointed or we get hurt we get angry we get jealous whatever it is right so there's there's a there's a like an immediate reaction now a lot of those immediate reactions are healthy. You know, if there's, God forbid, a danger in front of us, it does, it serves us well that we have a natural instinct of danger, like, uh oh, something bad's going to happen. Let me protect myself. That's a good instinct. But the, the point here is that we are driven by instinct. You know, we, we, we experience some sort of stimuli. We experience, we see something, we hear something, we sense something, and it goes to the part of the brain known as the amygdala, and that sends a signal to throughout our body to, you know, to brace for something or to react in a certain way. There's this instinctual reaction that we're not even aware of. Now, when we, when we start thinking about how we're feeling about something, and instead of just feeling it, we think about the feeling. So instead of just feeling or reacting, we say, wait a second, we, we pause and notice, wait, I'm feeling anger, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling jealous, I'm feeling hurt, I'm feeling, you know, um, ambivalent, whatever it is. When we notice the emotion, that moves it from the amygdala to the frontal cortex. In other words, it moves it from the part of the brain. This is all modern brain research and science that tells us how these systems work. It moves it from the instinctive part of the brain from the ancient instinctive part of the brain to the executive part of the brain, the part of executive function to figure out what to do and how to do it and make a rational decision. In other words, what is the key to moving away from in instinct 
and moving into a more um, a more conscious, a more measured approach. It's literally becoming aware of the process itself. This is what we call metacognitive or metacognition. Being aware of the process itself is the first key in moving the process in a different direction. Let me check in. Does that make sense? Yes? Sort of? Okay. So it's, it's, it's becoming aware of how we're thinking and what we're thinking that allows us to think and feel in a bit of a different way and to, to manage our emotions, to take control over ourselves. So in a very similar way, Overcoming Folly, the text that we're studying, although all, all that I've told you so far is classic modern brain science and positive psychology and research, et cetera. Okay. But what, what's amazing to me is that this, the text that we're studying, again, Overcoming Folly, knows this, knew this a long time ago, right? No, knew this a long time ago. Let me look quickly in the preface here and see what year this was penned. This was penned in, hold on. Why aren't we given a year over here? Hold on. Okay. I would put it at um, 21, uh, 2021. 100 and maybe 150 years ago or so, 130 years ago. Uh, a, lot of, a, a long time ago, this text was written. And the, 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 the concept, the thesis of, of this book that we're studying, Overcoming Folly, is that we are making decisions all the time. And many of them, later on, we regret. We ourselves regret. And we wonder to ourselves, we ask ourselves the question, what was I thinking? Right, we say to ourselves, "Oi, I messed up. What was I thinking? Or I can't believe I did that. Or I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I thought that. You know, what is wrong with me? What was I thinking?" This is what we're trying to avoid: how to overcome folly, how to overcome these negative decisions. And the way we might, the way we might consider, Donna, do you mind? Uh, thanks. The way we might consider that is like um, when you pull your car up to one of those gates. One of those gates that goes up and down or those arms in a parking lot or something. So the way it works is that in order to get past, right, someone or something has to trigger the arm to go up. Hey, Darren, good to see you. So something, someone has to trigger the arm to go up. Because as long as the arm is down, right, as long as the arm is down, the car, or the vehicle is not passing through. So something... Right. And in a parking lot, it's, uh, you know, either it's the payment or pulling the ticket or it's, you know, the, the person in the little booth over there that, 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 that triggers. I haven't seen him. He didn't come through here. So it's somebody, something or somebody triggers that arm going up to allow that vehicle to pass through. There's a very similar system in the way, the way it works in the brain, where the brain allows and decides that, you know, this this um, behavior or this decision or this word that I'm about to utter, this, this thought should pass through. Essentially, there's a part of our brain and part of our system that's signing off on everything that we think, say, or do. The purpose of the text that we're studying is to become a little bit more mindful of the process. How does this work? In other words, how does it work that we're allowing this behavior to go through? How does it work that we're allowing this these, these words to come through. How, what is it and, and how is it? What's the process by which we're allowing this thought to come through? So to be very clear here, in Kabbalah, there's a differentiation between the soul itself and what we call the garments of the soul. So the soul has 10 powers, 10 abilities. Three of them are intellectual, seven are emotional. In addition to the soul itself, there are three garments of the soul. What, what are garments of the soul? The garments of the soul are ways in which the soul expresses itself or manifests itself in this world. And what are those three garments? The three garments are thought, speech, and action. So our thought is a manifestation and putting into, putting into practice the ideas in our head. The difference between, by the way, ideas and thoughts is idea or knowledge. 
you know, you know a lot of things. You know that the capital of Florida is Tallahassee. Did I get that right? That is the capital of Florida, right? Yes, Tallahassee. Okay, so you know that, but you weren't thinking that until I mentioned it. There's a difference between things that you know and things that you're thinking of. So Kabbalah teaches that what you know is one part of your soul system. What you're thinking about is what we call not the soul itself, but the garment of the soul. That is what your soul is putting itself into, just like clothing. You can take off, you can put on clothing, you can take off clothing, you can switch clothing, you can switch your thoughts. You can choose to think about something or to not think about something. Now, it's very difficult, right? If you're thinking about something, your, your mind is telling you to think about something or some impulse inside is saying, think about this. It's very hard to muster that self-control to not thinking about it, to not think about it. But Kabbalah says it's not the soul, thought, active thought. Ideas, not another, another animal. But active thought is not your soul. It's the garment of the soul. And the implication of a garment, as I just mentioned, is you can put it on, you can take it off, you can switch the garment to a different garment, right? You get dressed in the morning, you're deciding, what am I going to wear? Am I going to wear this or that? Am I going to wear something bright or something more muted, something loud, something, something soft? Whatever it is, you can change your feel. You can change your look with your clothing. You can change your thoughts. By the way, this is the whole premise behind meditation. The whole premise behind meditation and mindfulness is that we have the ability to choose what we want to think about. Again, going back to how I started today's class, I, I my position is, and, and it's, it's something that's a conversation in modern positive psychology and brain science, is that all too often, we don't pay attention to what it is that we're thinking about and what it is that we're feeling until it's too late. In other words, we only become aware of our emotions and how we're doing inside, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, when we explode, either we get angry or we're very sad or we're very jealous or we're very judgmental, whatever it is. When the emotion becomes overwhelming, that's when we're like, oh, what happened? Where did that come from? Or we just go with it and end up hurting ourselves and others. Hopefully not, right? So the whole purpose of this conversation in Kabbalah is to understand, which predates modern brain science and psychology and all that stuff, right? This is ancient wisdom. The whole premise of this Kabbalistic idea is that you and I absolutely, absolutely have the ability to be aware of our thoughts, aware of our emotions, aware of what it is that we're about to say, and of course, aware of what it is that we're about to do. And because of that awareness, we have the ability to choose whether the arm goes up or the arm stays down, the arm being the barrier between going for it or not going for it. Yeah. So I think what I'm hearing is so we want to take control of our emotions, so all these external thought processes become kind of a neutralized and abstract and putting on different color of clothing. Correct. Well, I, I, yeah, so there's two things. Number one, our emotions are 100% governed or can be governed by our mind. I said before that we know that when something dangerous comes at us, right, there is a, there's a part of the brain, the amygdala, that interprets the danger, let's say, and then it sends signals, electrical impulse through our body, and we react in a way of defensiveness or we jump out of the way of, et cetera. But becoming aware, slowing it down, right, becoming aware, it's like in baseball, slow down the pitch, Right, slow it down, slow down the game, slow down basketball, slow it down, right? The greats are able to see things a little bit slower. They're not overwhelmed by what's going on. It's about slowing it down and understanding what it is that we're seeing now. And in a case of danger, we do want to um, respond in a quick way, but most times it doesn't rise to that level and it's not on that level of danger. And then it does us a disservice. It's not a good thing to be reactive like that emotionally and instinctually. What's, what's, what's healthier is to process it more mindfully, to think about what it is that we're seeing, what it is that we're hearing, what it is that we're experiencing, and then to think about our own thoughts about it, and that helps govern our emotional reaction. The key idea in Kabbalah is moach shalit al halev, which is Hebrew for the mind has control by nature over the heart, over the emotions. The mind, the brain, naturally has that ability. Now we can choose 
to let, you know, to let things run wild. And we do that often by just keeping that gate up, right? You ever have that experience where you're in a parking lot and like you're expecting to have to pay on the way out? You parked it for a little while and just, the arms up and you're like, cool. <laughs> That's great. I don't have to pull out the push. Don't have to shell out any money, right? All right? I've had that before, like unexpected. But that sometimes we just leave the door open. And, and everything that comes in and everything that we think and everything that we feel just runs rampant inside of us. And the next thing you know, we're, we're in an emotional mess, and hopefully not. But the next thing we know, we're feeling all sorts of feelings inside. And it, and it doesn't feel good. And we're wondering, like, how do we get here? How do we get to this place where we're just unhappy, where we're sad, where we're depressed, where we're, you know, anxious, where we're jealous, where we're angry? Like, how, how do we get there? And if we rewound, if we rewound the tape, we would realize that there were many different things that we kind of weren't, we, that we weren't paying attention to. We let slide. We didn't reframe in a healthy way. We just let go. So that's vis a vis emotions. When we move the conversation to, let's say, behavior, right? When it comes to acting impulsively and doing something that, forget outside judgment, that we ourselves would look back, will look back later and say, what was I thinking? can't believe I did that, or I can't believe I said that, or I can't believe I was thinking that. So what is it that's allowing that arm to go up to allow those thoughts, words, or actions to emanate from us? Yaakov, jump in with a question. Yeah, so you said, uh, even though we <clears throat> aren't <clears throat> consciously thinking that Tallahassee is the um, capital of Florida, that that knowledge is, is part of, has become part of our subconscious. So if thoughts are one of the three um, garments of the soul, what about, um, you know, where, where, does, where does that knowledge fit in? The things that Good. kind of run the show, our subconscious that basically Good. dictates our behavior, how does that fit in? So here's the thing. So I want to just, I want to answer your question, but also the last thing that you said, I want to I wanna push back on. That yeah. doesn't dictate our behavior. What dictates okay. our behavior is not the subconscious as much as it is the consciousness. In other words, if I, if I, and now, hold on. Let me, let me clarify. Let me qualify what I'm saying. It's, I'm not suggesting that it never happens that our subconscious impulses drive us in a certain way. But what I am suggesting is that our mind is strong enough at any given moment to keep the arm down on that, to stop the thought from continuing. It's like a pop-up back in the day before ad blockers. I use a browser that, that has built-in spyware, adware, pop-up blocker. So I don't, on a, on a regular, I don't deal with this anymore. But back in the day, right? Boom. You're on a website, something pops up. That you can't control, right? But what you can control is what you do next. Are you clicking on it? Are you following that link? Or are you shutting it down? So the subconscious, just to address your question, there is, yes, there are ideas. There are notions. There are, right, that, that, that we have inside that, that send those impulses, send those thoughts, send those ideas to the front of our mind, to our thought. But our conscious thought has the ability to choose to block it, to, to, uh, to push it back into the subconscious and not to think about it. Now, when we believe, when we're not even aware that we have that ability, we have zero chance of exercising that ability. It's like any muscle. If you don't know that you have it, you're not going to be able to use it. But the moment you know that you have that ability, that you can control what you're thinking, not control everything that pops into your mind or anything that's, or everything that's shown to you from outside, right? We don't have control over the, uh, over the subconscious impulses that pop into our brain or the external ones that come right in front of our eyes. But we do have control 100% if we choose to exercise it, we do have control over what happens next. Do we dwell on it? Do we entertain it, entertain the thought, or do we shut it down and block it? This is, again, one of the most essential teachings of Kabbalah and Hasidic philosophy. The idea that Moach Shalt Halalev, and it begins with believing in the ability. If you don't believe in the ability, or it's not, it's not I don't mean to make it sound hocus pocus. If we don't know that we have this, this ability, then we're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to exercise it. We'll think we're just a victim of our, of our own thoughts or a victim of, 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 of stimuli that comes to us. And the major, the big idea here is we absolutely have that, that ability. We have the ability to keep that arm down. Even when there's, there's pressure mounted against it, we can keep it down. Very, very uh, simple way of understanding this. Could I ask any person, do you, have, do you have the ability for five seconds to choose what you're going to think about? To not be a victim of, when I say victim, to not 
have some other force decide what you're going to think about. Five seconds. Can you, can you consciously choose what you are going to think about? Sure. Five, se five seconds. Sure. Another five seconds. Just make that five seconds. Keep on going. In other words, we have the ability to choose what we're going to think about. The only the challenge is, do we keep on doing that? This is where the practice of meditation, known in Kabbalah as hit bonanut, which means contemplation, this is where meditation or contemplation comes in super handy. It's about not in moments of stress or moments of, of tension or moments of anger or moments of jealousy, moments of rage. No, that's a, at the car, the, the, the horse has left the, whatever the expression is, that, it's already too late at that point, to, not too late, but it's, that's already in a moment of stress. You don't fix the roof while it's raining. You wait till it's dry and you can, you can get up there on the roof and not slip down. So you want to you address this in a state of calm. And, and practice meditation and contemplation in a way where you're mindfully choosing your thoughts. Study a piece of Kabbalah and, and think about it, contemplate it. Not, it's not clearing the mind. It's not focusing on nothing. It's focusing on an idea of your choosing for one minute and then three minutes and then five minutes and then 10 minutes and then 15 minutes and then 30 minutes to train yourself to be in control of your thoughts. It's absolutely possible. It's absolutely feasible. Not only that, is it possible and feasible? It's necessary to be a healthy human being. Again, why aren't we taught this as kids? I don't know. But the <laughs> we're, we're very reactive by, by nature. Fine, it's human nature. But we've been given a brain, we've been given a, given a mind, and we have, thank God, a lot, lots of teachings to help guide us through this process. That's not necessarily what Hitbonanut is in Kabbalah. Hitbonanut is more, I'm going to think about an idea, a Kabbalistic idea that I've studied. Or even, for example, today, right? Like we're, le we're learning about the difference between the soul and the garments of the soul. The soul, we're not going to rewire the soul day one. It's not, that's a long-term project. We may never get there. But the garment, at least the garments, we can choose what goes on and what comes off and what we're wearing, what we're not wearing, right? We can choose the garments. So even that concept itself to think about, not, it's not necessarily a visual, but it's a concept to think about, a concept to think about and how can I apply that and how can I, and you're just choosing the subject matter. Focusing your thoughts. Focusing your thoughts on an idea. It doesn't have to be on an image. Look, I'm not saying it, it can't be on an image. It could also be on an image, but even on just the concept, on a concept that is empowering and healing. If you're a kicker, right, for a, a football team and you have the chance to win the game, Super Bowl, right? The chance to win the game, two seconds left on the clock. Yeah, 30 yard field goal, you miss the kick. So it's a tie game. You could have won the game. Now, now it's tied, now it's going to overtime. And then overtime, you have another chance to win the game with a kick. The worst thing you can do is think about the kick that you missed. It's the worst thing you can do. But isn't that what you're thinking about? How do you not think about that? It doesn't matter. Just <laughs> got to figure, make a plan. Got to think about something else, anything else. Right? You got to be in control. If your heart is racing, right? Your heart is racing. Your, your brain is all over the place. You're feeling anxious. You're feeling, you know, you're closing up. You're feeling, you know, the pressure of the moment, the pressure of the fans, the disappointment to your teammates that you caused before, if you're feeling all that, the odds are more likely, the odds are higher that you'll miss the next one. You got to stay in control. Stay in, how do we stay in control? It's the brain. It's the mind. That's how we stay in control. It's yeah. I was walking a where about Yeah. Could be that that's a visual. So that's more along the lines of what Donna said. It's more along the lines of a visual where you're focusing on the four letters of God's name, the tetragrammaton, the yod and the hey and the vav and the hey. And that visual in classic Kabbalah, there's always it's it's there may be a visual, but there's always a concept behind the visual. So there's always something that you're processing in your brain, which is very helpful. It's very helpful to have that that something else to think about, because if you don't have anything to think about, right, then you're just going to be stuck in that negative, and when I say negative, I'm not, I'm not judging it as negative. I'm saying you feel yourself it's negative. Like you don't wanna be thinking about that. You don't wanna be stressed with that. 
with that thought. You don't have that anxiety or that anger or that, you know, uh, whatever it is, that negative emotion for yourself. Again, this is no external judgment. This is just a person on their own feeling that this, I don't want to be in this place of feeling. The question is, okay, so what are you going to think about? What's, what's, what, what is your choice thought? And again, the ideas that you have in your head, the ideas that you know, ideas that you've, that you've thought about before, all of that you can't get rid of. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna undo, delete those ideas. But we can choose what we're thinking about in the moment. We can choose, obviously, what we say in the moment. We can choose, Talmud says, the classic work of Jewish law, the Talmud says that God gave us two, speaking about arms going up and down, two arms, doesn't use the word arms, two um, block, blockages, blockades in front of the tongue. The teeth and the lips, right? If you close your mouth, right? The tongue is, is stuck with be, behind teeth and lips. Gave us two chances to not say that, that nasty thing or the thing that we'll regret later, the hurtful thing or the reactive thing or the angry thing. Two, two even if the teeth open, the lips could still close or the lips open, the teeth could still close. We have to exercise that you have to. It's, it's the healthy thing is to exercise that choice. And certainly with action, we know we can just, you know, you just put our hands in our pockets and not do the thing that we want to do. Anyway, what's my point? My point is simply like this. The book, the book that we're studying, Overcoming Folly, is all about understanding what it is that allows us internally to open that arm to allow the negative choice to come through. What, what, what is the thought process inside? Even if we typically, even if it typically happens so fast that we don't even know What's going on? It's about slowing it down and saying, one second, one second, hold on. How did I get here? How did I get here? What, what was my thought process? What, what did I, what was the narrative? And this is a big, this is a big idea in Kabbalah. What was my narrative? What was my story? How did I allow this to get through? What did I tell myself to make it okay? Because I know, I know it's not okay. I mean, assuming something's not okay, right? I know it's, I know it's not okay. So how did I let myself, how did I make it okay for myself to do it. I want to, be, I'm going to emphasize this again, probably third or fourth, or fifth time. This is not a judgment. This is no one else judging anyone else. This is not an external judgment. This is an internal dialogue and, and, a, and, a, and an opportunity for internal growth for betterment of self, self-improvement. So it's a process that begins with me asking myself, what was it that I said to myself to allow myself to engage in this action, to engage in this negative talk or to engage in this, you know, detrimental, unhealthy thought. What, what is the narrative? And we've gone through many of these so far in this text, and we're up to, to discourse number 13. And the, the one that we're focusing on that we did two weeks ago at our last session was this idea that a person tells themselves, I am too weak, or I am unable to hold myself back. Because this passion, she's using passion as a general word, this desire, temptation, passion, vice, whatever it is, is too strong for me to hold back. So therefore, gates are open because I can't hold it back anyway. It's a decision that we made to call ourselves weak in this area. And that decision to call ourselves weak becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. When I believe that I'm weak in this area, then I won't be able to, then I'm choosing not to exercise my strength and allowing that negative to go through. That is in the language of, of our text, which we'll jump back into in a moment. That is a choice that we're making to view ourselves as weak. Because if we knew or believed that we had strength in this area, if we knew that we could withhold or withstand this push, this rush from the inside, the internal rush, if we knew we could withstand it, then we would withstand it. It's when we don't believe that we can, that we cannot. So let me give you an illustration of this from yesterday's Torah portion. So in Jewish synagogues around the world yesterday, we read the section in the Bible from the book of Genesis, from the book of uh, Bereshis, that speaks about the story of Jacob how he finds his wife. So what happens? Here's the short story. Jacob leaves home 
Well, for a few reasons. Number one, his brother's not happy with him. Number two, he's looking, looking to get married. So he goes to a place called Haran to find a wife. There he is. He arrives at the well, the well of, you know, water. They didn't have plumbing. They didn't have water in every, you know, we're, we're very um, lucky to have the amenities that we have. And um, so he goes to this well. And at the well, he notices that there are a lot of shepherds, a bunch of shepherds hanging around with their animals. And he's thinking, why is everybody just hanging out over here by the well? I mean, when you go, come to a well, give the animal, it's the middle of the day, give your animals water to drink and move on, right? Let's, there's a lot to do in the life of a shepherd. Now, I have no idea what the life of a shepherd looks like, but Jacob was judging these shepherds saying like, what's, what's going on? Now, the Torah, the Bible fills in the narrative why they were waiting. Why were they waiting? Why were they hanging around? So apparently, the custom of that well, they had a massive stone, massive boulder that was on top of the well. And it took all the shepherds to gather, all the local shepherds to gather, to lift off the stone altogether. It was a very heavy stone, and they, they, they waited till everybody was there to lift off the stone. Why did they have a heavy stone? Probably in order to ensure that no one stole water or whatever it was. Anyway, what happens? The narrative continues. Jacob sees Rachel, who he ultimately marries. He sees this girl approaching. She was a shepherdess. She's approaching with the sheep. And immediately, he's filled with this strength, and he lifts up, single-handedly lifts up the stone on top of the well, throws it off, and gives and helps her with the water for her sheep. Who said chivalry is dead? Oh, he's like such a, such a gentleman, such a strong, right? Such a hero, saved the day and, and, and gave Rachel's flock the water. That, that's the story that the Bible tells us. And I mentioned this at our, we, at our daily, uh, the daily, daily power parsha. I guess that's redundant, AKA DPP, daily power parsha, our 12 o'clock noon daily class. I mentioned this last week. Um, that there's a commentary that says, how is it that Jacob was able to take off, to roll up, to take, to remove the stone when no one else could do? What suddenly he was filled with this, you know, superhuman strength or this adrenaline? Like what, what happened? Like people that lift cars off of, you know, God forbid, off of children, whatever. Like what happened? So there's a commentary that says no. That for some reason, all of the other shepherds believed that no one could do it, them, that, that each one of their own couldn't do it. And so they had this belief that they, that they were unable to do it. But Jacob didn't have that preconceived notion of weakness or preconceived notion that that's too heavy for him. So he tried and he was able to do it, which reminds us, and this is why I mentioned the story, reminds us of this court life truth. And that is so often what holds us back, right? is our belief that we can't do something. As opposed to being an objective reality that we cannot, there's a subjective belief that we can't or that I can't, I can't do this, or I don't do that, or you know, I can only do this, but not that. And that itself serves as my own tether, my own shackles to keep me tied down. The belief that I can't makes it once again, a self-fulfilling prophecy. So in the context of our conversation that we started Two weeks ago in Discourse 13, it's a person saying that, well, this area is, is too powerful for me. Like this temptation is too strong for me to hold myself back. And every time this thing comes up, that's when I fail. That's like my go-to vice or my go-to, you know, personal failure is in this area. Well, what can I do? It's, it's too strong for me. That narrative that it's too strong or it's too big or I'm too weak in this area, that itself becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy that keeps us shackled, that keeps us a, a victim to this area. What's the solution? Not, not, to, not to oversimplify it, but a piece of the solution is to believe that you have the ability. Not you. I, that I should, I, I need to believe that I have the ability. Instead of me telling myself I can't, I tell myself I can't. Now, does, is that, does that magically solve everything? No, but it empowers me to at least some of the energy and, and the strength that it will take to combat this formidable foe. 
I want to quote the book of Tanya. The book of Tanya is one of the greatest books of Kabbalah and human behavior, behavioral psychology, and just everything wrapped in one. And in Tanya, he gives the example of wrestlers. Not like WWE wrestlers, like, like, like old school wrestling, like physical combat. He says, you have two wrestlers. And one is clearly stronger than the other. He says, the stronger one could lose the match if, if their heart is not into it. If they're in a bad mood, if they're depressed, if they're anxious. In other words, you can be stronger than the other, but not be feeling right. And that might lead to being vanquished by the other. You have to be mentally and emotionally primed, ready to go. You have to be strong mentally and emotionally in addition to the physical strength. Now, it could be that even someone who's like much, much stronger than the other guy, even if emotionally, if they're off their game or, or mentally, they might still beat the other. But that's not the, the point is when you have like, you know, a little bit of an advantage, but you're not feeling, this happens in professional sports all the time. Right, momentum shifts, momentum swings. Remember the Falcons, 28-3. Remember that game? Yeah. Man. I remember that. Whole, let me just meditate on that for a second, like or just recount that. We so my kids were following it. Whatever, we were all excited. You know, Falcons Super Bowl, and then it was the night of Yud Shvat, the tenth of Shvat, which is the anniversary of the Rebbe assuming leadership of the Chabad movement. And uh, so we came to Fabrengen at Chabad, the old Chabad, the, the, the house on Ponce, the other Ponce, Ponce Ave. And um, like, it was a no-brainer. It was like in the bag, 28-3, let's go to Fabrengen. Like, that's it. <laughs> the night's set. We, we, got a, we got a good night lined up here. Next thing you know. But what happens with momentum is suddenly, like, what is it? It's, it's, it's an emotional thing. What? Because that team scored one touchdown and now instead of being... 25 points is now 20, 18 points, whatever it is, whatever the math is, right? And so, th does that really change the game? You're still ahead. What is the, what is the deal with the momentum with, with that energy shift? It's not the score. It's the emotional and psychological effect. It's one team feeling confident and the other one feeling not confident. And the confidence breeds victory and the lack of confidence breeds defeat now not always and it could switch back the other way and it goes back and forth the pendulum swings back and forth as anyone who follows sports or any or any you know matches knows whether it's a tennis match whatever it is or wrestling match except the ones that are scripted that's something else the outcome is already is already penned um so what's my point my point is simply this it says in tanya the two wrestlers the superior one might lose to the inferior one. The stronger one could lose to the weaker one if the stronger one is not feeling it, not in it, not, not feeling okay. And so the message for us is we have that control innately. We have that control. We have that ability. But when we believe that we don't, that itself serves as our own kryptonite. That serves as our own handcuffs. That serves as our own limitation believing or not believing in ourselves right it causes our own detriment okay all of that is kind of just kind of a bit of a recap but also some other ideas that we, i didn't fill in last time what we're going to do today and i'm going to pause a moment for some more questions but what we're going to do today is <laughs> is analyze this from a place of kabbalah and ask the question is that really the case is it really the case that we truly do have control over all of our vices, that our lower self is, is indeed weaker than our higher self? Is that actually the case? Because maybe objectively, if maybe one could argue on the contrary, that our lower self is stronger than our higher self. And if that's the case, then maybe we are powerless to, um, to, to push back on, 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 that, on those inner desires. Okay, so we're going to address the question and hopefully answer it. In today's session in discourse 13. Give me a second, let me pass this around. Um, but jump in. Yaakov, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna listen to your question. Go, jump in. Oh, you have all right. 
So, <clears throat> you, yeah, the key word you just said was, um, you know, belief in self. And it's it, apparently uh, a big part of why we're here is to define ourselves, define our soul. <clears throat> so um, it, it takes courage to stand up for yourself. You know, people that have had childhoods where they've been beaten down um, emotionally and, and others for whatever reason, maybe uh, good intentions, bad intentions, telling them that they're not as powerful or as talented as they should be. So the, I, I guess my, my short question is, how do we build up that, that self-belief and um, so that we, we do have the courage to think positively and, and feel positively? So first of all, very well stated, very well stated question. Um, I, I think, I think um, it, it comes down to, right, in a, in a world that so often tells us how weak and powerless we are. And by the way, the world does say this. Society says this in very subtle ways. It tells us how weak we are and how, like, for example, with happiness, it's a related, it's not exactly what we're talking about, but it's a related topic because it's all about like our inner, our inner sense of self. Society will tell us, Madison Avenue, right, marketing will tell us you can't be happy without this thing. Right? You're not going to be happy unless you have that thing. <laughs> what does it tell us? That you're weak and unhappy unless you buy this thing. Or We get, we get bombarded. Uh, Yaakov, I'm, I'm, I'm enhancing your question. Or not, not enhancing, I'm supporting your question. Right? We get told whether, you know, God forbid, by parents or teachers or by friends or by, you know, or by society or by media, whatever it is, that we're, that we're weak, that we're powerless, that we can't. And so that becomes the process of, a, of, of, of the growth of our lives to build up ourselves, not in a narcissistic way, not in an ego-driven way, but recognizing with humility our God-given strength. The idea that the Bible tells us, the Torah tells us that we're created in the, in, in the image of God and the divine image is not meant to make a person egotistical. Not make, it's not meant to make a person to turn, turn them into a narcissist. Like, oh, I'm in, I'm in the divine image, then I can do anything, right? I'm God, I'm top... Point is not about ego. It's a, it's it's about a it's about an inner confidence. It's like if I'm creating the image of God, then I can do this. Now you're asking specifically, how do we build up that strength? I would say, but you know, you're asking me. I would say, this is where Kabbalah study comes in. Study Kabbalah, and I'm sure there's other things you can also study as well. But studying Kabbalah tells us about the soul, tells us about our relationship with God, tells us about the strength that we have, and it's when we study it, and then not just study it and pack it away for the week or for the day. But when we unpack it continuously throughout the day, when we meditate on it, and we engage in these types of explorations internally, that's what slowly, slowly builds the, um, that's what slowly builds our strength. Um, I wanted to find a second here. There's a there's a beautiful um, poem. Maybe it's not a poem. I think it's a poem. It says, "Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God." Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in everyone. And when we let our own, our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. We have this tendency in for whatever reason, in not wanting to feel strong. That's kind of the premise of this idea. Uh, we can analyze this. We can put this idea on, on a couch and, you know, psychologically and analyze it. But for whatever reason, this is, this is kind of where we're at. And so the goal is to recognize we are strong. We do have the ability. We have that power. What we're going to do right now is actually jump into chapter two of Discourse 13 and actually phrase... Pose the question, are we really strong, though? 
is, is our higher self, known as the godly soul, truly more dominant than the animal soul, the lower self? Just to explain these terms, is a big idea in Kabbalah, that we have two drives inside of us, the animal soul and the godly soul. The animal soul is what pulls us into instinctual behavior, self-preservation mode, ego-driven, I'm hungry, I need to eat, I feel threatened, I need to lash out. The animal, nothing wrong with the animal, is not evil, but it's, it's very instinctive. The godly soul is that higher self that allows us to live a selfless, more noble existence. And what we're suggesting, um, what we suggested last time is when a person says, hey, it's not my fault, or I have to, you know, I have to give in to this temptation, it's too big for me to handle, we suggested last time that that's not true. We do have the ability to overcome. Today, we're going to ask the question, is that really the case? Make sense? Okay, so let's jump into the text. I'm going to pull it up on the screen for everyone joining online. Give me one second. Hold on. This is going to be, again, chapter two, discourse 13. Page in the book, it's page 194. So the author, the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, writes the following. He asks, it's not really a rhetorical question. It's really like a legitimate question. But where does the godly soul get the strength to dominate the animal soul? We just explained that it's a folly. It's, it's, it's a shtus. It's a folly to think that I can't. When I think I can't, then I won't. So don't think you can't because you can. You have the strength. Your godly soul, your higher self, which is associated also with the mind, has the ability to control the lower self, which is associated with the, the emotions. That is that natural ability. But he's asking here, where does, it get that, where, where does it get that power to dominate? And he's now going to support his question. It is written, this is from the book of Proverbs. It is written, so, such an interesting phrase, so, so wise, written by King Solomon. It says, the first is righteous in his quarrel. You see that line? The first is righteous in his quarrel. What does that mean? So the commentary, Mitsuda David, one of the commentaries on scripture, the commentary explains that the first to argue his, his side can flavor his words and be persuasive for there is no one to dispute him. Let me give you an example. Somebody, a friend comes over to you and says, can't believe it. Do you know what this guy did to me? Unbelievable. It gives you a whole story. And you say, it's terrible. I can't believe it. That's not right. In other words, they presented the case. They presented their side of whatever it is, the dispute. And they made it sound perfectly reasonable. And now your, um, your image of the story is completely biased based on the first one that got your ear. Now what happens? Now when you, when you turn to the other guy at some point later and you say, what's going on? I heard you, uh, you're, 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 you're not being nice to that other guy, whatever the case is, right? They're like, no, let me tell you, let me explain what happened. Now, you, could, you might be objective, but you also might find it a little harder to be objective because you've already created a narrative based on the first, which is what King Solomon says in Proverbs. The first is righteous in his quarrel. Not that he's really righteous, but the first one has the upper hand. Whoever goes first has the upper hand. Now, I, and you're probably thinking, so then how do you ever have a court case? Because you listen to two sides. Well, I mean, there's ways to do it where you're not, you're not jumping and 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 you're not believing the first one, even though they're first, because you're, you, you know there's two, there's two right in front of you. Whereas when you hear just one, that becomes the, the reality, and it becomes harder to undo that, yeah. A bias. Oh, oh, oh a built-in mechanism to hopefully safeguard. Let, let's not, uh, yeah. Of the defense, yes. hopefully, right. not always, right. but, I mean, as we know. Theory. Remember the crime and consequence. Your dad was a lawyer, right? Defense, defense attorney. Defense. Defense. Yeah, he dedicated his life to. Yeah, I know that's why. Yeah, I'm passionate about that as well. My father was Buddhist, 
and he was passionate about something years ago, but so, so he's, it's as if his own life was at stake, you know, as if he would go to jail. Or, right. So, Which is the way it needs to be done. Yes, but I mean, from what, from what upset me, I saw that there was no more justice. I mean, I saw how much personality, like a judge wanted to play golf, so he made the jury worry about Right. Yeah. This. So. So that's when you bring up the criminal justice system, and Donna's mentioning just for everyone online. Donna's mentioning um, her her dad being a criminal uh, criminal defense attorney um, in in making sure that the voice of the underdog was going to be heard, and making sure that, but getting stacked up into getting feeling the pressure of of, of other biases and other factors. And, I, and one of them here, at least what King Solomon writes about, maybe it's not necessarily in a court, although there is a lot of other biases in a court, is the idea that the first one is righteousness quarrel. I was, it's interesting. I was listening to a podcast last night, unrelated, like, I don't want to get into the details of that podcast, but the point, well, okay, it was about, it was like a true crime, true crime podcast about it. And it was like when, when the investigators have a narrative, the first narrative it's really hard to undo that, right? When you have, you, you get your first evidence, you get your first witnesses, you get your first, and you create, okay, narrative based on that, and you start going with that. When you come up against contradictory evidence or testimony, it's really hard to like question that because you already, you already built something off of that. Anyway, the point is the first is right, righteous to squirrel. Now, how does that relate to any of what we're talking about today with the internal system of lower self, higher self? You'll see in a moment, but let's continue. When two opponents, we're in the middle of that second paragraph where it says when two opponents, when two opponents come simultaneously to plead their cases, well, then each one, each weakens the other. That's a healthy model where you're getting simultaneous pushback. So you're not invested in any one of them, ideally, you're not invested in any one side specifically, and each one is going to balance out the other. And you, since it says in, in ethics of our father, ethics of the father's prickia vote, which is the, uh, the ethical tractate in the Mishnah, it says a judge should always view both litigants as, as guilty. In other words, as liars. Be skeptical about both of them. And then when the ju when justice prevails, then you then you can sort it out. But in other words, don't don't jump on any one of their sides because the moment you jump on one, you've just now you're not given a fair shake to the other. So ideally here, you're skeptical of both, right? And then each one is weakening the other. But let's finish off this paragraph. But when one comes first, and I think the implication is not when you have two people who goes first, because you can't speak at the same time. But it means when one presents it without any presence of the other one altogether, they're the only one in the room, they, they're the only one that has your ear, well, then he can flavor his words. I like that phrase, flavor, in the Hebrew. Oh, lahatim, it, flavor, yeah, flavor spice his words and be persuasive for there's no one to oppose him and to weaken his claim. Now, what does that have to do with us? You ready for the bombshell? Here we go. Similarly, the animal and godly souls, lower self and higher self, or um, selfish self and selfless self, ego, selflessness, right? These two parts of within us, these two forces oppose each other. They are diametrically opposed they are opponents i said i thought we talked before about the garments of the soul each one is vying for control over the to choose what we wear so the animal soul says think about this the godly soul says no think about that and we have this conflict inside that we're navigating we have only one set of thoughts at any given moment, set of thoughts, only one thought that we're thinking about at any given moment, but two equally powerful, two forces inside that are pushing their agenda or speech or action. When it comes to the garments, there's one set of garments, but two kings trying to fight over that dominion. But here's the point. Here's the big idea, which we're about to come. This is the bombshell. The animal soul, the lower self, inhabits the body when? When does the animal soul get in at birth. The Talmud says, tracted Sanhedrin 91b, when does the Yetzirah, that's the evil inclination, the lower self, when does that evil inclination rule man? From the time he leaves the womb. In other words, from birth, our ego is already present. Now, ego doesn't necessarily mean evil, negative, you know, oh, terrible. No, ego is 
also has a, 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 an innocent manifestation. It's not necessarily bad, but this lower self, instinctive self, this self-preservation self kicks in at birth. Let me give you a very simple way to understand this. A baby cries in the middle of the night when it's hungry. No baby ever said, look, my mother is sleeping. My dad is sleeping. They need the rest. You know what? I just ate a few hours ago. I'll make it to the morning. I'm okay. Now, as adults, do we do this? Sure, right? Hopefully, we don't cry and lose it if we're a little hungry. Again, I said hopefully, right? Hopefully, we're able to muster some self-control, which we'll get to in a moment. When does that self-control kick in? We'll see it's at a later date. But our first modality as human beings, the first approach in life is me, 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 me. Now, it's not, we're not judging it as bad. We're just calling a spade a spade. The animal soul enters at birth, right? Dr. Maxi, you're a pediatrician, right? Can you speak to this? Are babies inherently self-driven? It's not a bad thing, but is this a truth? It is a truth. It is a truth. That's it. It's not a bad thing. No one's, it's not like, oh, babies are evil. Now, God forbid, we love babies. Love babies, right? Kids, this is not a judgment. This is just a fact. The fact is that at birth, we get our instinctive self, instinctual self. It's not a bad thing. It's just a thing thing. Medjish Rabbah, let's continue inside. Medjish Rabbah interprets the word. So interesting. This is the Medrash, this is the, the teaching, the homiletical teaching on the, the story of Noah. Remember Noah and the flood, no, right? Noah's Ark. So before God destroys the world with a flood, God says, you know why I'm going to destroy the world? Because the nature of humankind is evil, minura, from his youth. The Midrash, so let's understand what minura from his youth means. Let's get back inside. Midrash Rabbah, Noah, 3412, interprets the word minura as not just from his youth, but from the moment he is aroused or stirred to leave the, to leave the womb. Minurav could either be now, which means from a young age, or, 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 or minurav could also mean from the moment of the first stirring, the first movements of life itself. So from the moment of birth, already there is a lower self, a self-protective self. Again, it's not a bad thing. It's a thing. What about the godly soul? What about the higher self? When does that kick in? When does the idea of I'm going to give up for the sake of someone else? Or it's okay, I don't need, let me put someone else first. Or when does that kick in? When does that higher self kick in? The godly soul, I'm going to add the word however, back inside, inhabits the body at 13, the age of religious obligation. Actually, in Jewish law, it's 12 for a girl, 13 for a boy, because girls mature a little faster than boys. Nonetheless, at around that age, 12, 13, is when there is, this is, again, this is a, it's, not, it's not only a spiritual thing, but it's a physical thing, I guess. The spiritual is what makes the physical this reality. That's when a, a child can be responsible and expected to defy, to go against their own nature. Again, their nature might be self-preservation. I want it. I want to have it. Sure. But when can we say to a, to a young person, I know you want it, but let it go, right? When can we reasonably expect that? About 12 or 13. And why is that so? So in Kabbalah, it says, because that's when the godly soul, the higher self, fully integrates, or at least a little bit more fully integrates with the human being. Let's continue inside. Midrash Rabbah. One of the, again, the Midrash Rabbah on Kohelet, on Ecclesiastes, and the verse that says, uh, this, listen to this, this is powerful. The verse says, a lad who is poor and wise, right? A kid who's poor and wise is better than an old and foolish king. What does that mean? A lad who is poor and wise is better than an old and foolish king. So, so let's just first understand the verse itself. On the one hand, there's a lad. On the other hand, there's an older individual. So you would put the, the value perhaps in the older person who has more experience, whatever. And then the lad is poor and the older one is a king, which means that they're, I mean, presumably wealthy. But the, the only thing that goes on the side of the other one is one that the, the lad that's poor is wise 
and the and the old king is foolish. Aha, uh -huh. interesting. And that, and that um, King Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes that makes the lad who's poor but wise better than the old king who's foolish. What are we talking about? Kings and kids? Like, what are we talking about? A foolish king? I mean, there have been many throughout history, many horrible kings also, but like, what are we talking about? So the Midrash explains, back inside, that the lad who is poor and wise refers to the eight Sahara, the good inclination, the higher self. And why is it called a lad? Because he attaches to men, he, it, this force attaches to men, to the human being from the age of 13. While the old and foolish king is the eight Sahara, the lower self, why is it called old? Because he attaches to man from childhood until old age. And similar thoughts are expressed in the Zohar. Let me explain this, and hopefully it'll be very clear. When does the lower self kick in? From the moment of birth. When does the higher self kick in? From 13. So now you're 30 years old. Which part of, which inner voice has more experience? <laughs> the old and foolish king. It's got, it's, it's got seniority. That selfish, that selfish drive inside, the self-preservation, the ego, the lower self, has 13 years on the higher self. Understand where he's going with this. He's asking the question, maybe we are weak. Maybe we don't have control over that lower self. Maybe that lower self is stronger. That's what he's positing right now. That's the question. He's saying, one second, one second. Just said before that you have to believe that you have the ability to overcome and then you'll overcome. And don't think that you're overwhelmed by the power of that temptation because you have control over it. Who says? The temptation exists from birth. I mean, in various forms, right? No, it's foolish. It's the lad is poor and wise. He's going to explain poor in a moment. The lad means the younger the younger, the God, no, no, the lad is the godly soul. It's called lad because it has less years of influence. It has less time, it less time of influence, right? So it's, let's say at 30, it's 17 years of influence versus 30 years of influence. So this, this one's a kid showing up to like, the king is like, I got this. I, I know how to, I know which buttons to press. I got this. And the, and the kid's like, the godly soul's like, wait, 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 let's do this. Like, Amateur, amateur hour here, right? So the King Solomon is, is saying that it's better to listen to the lad who's poor and wise than the old and foolish king. So that's good advice. But if we're asking the question, let's ask the question. One's a lad, one's an old king. One's a, one's a poor lad, one's an old king. Yeah, sure, this one's telling you good advice. This one's bad advice. But you know what? Sounds like the strength lies with that old and foolish king. Right. That's why he's called lad, because he attached to man from the age of 13, while the old and foolish king is the eight Sahara called old because he attached man from childhood until old age. He can, concludes that paragraph by saying similar thoughts are expressed in Zohar, which is the primary work of Kabbalah in the Torah portion of Ayesha of 179a. Now, let's continue. He now is going to question his question by citing another teaching that says that the godly soul also arrives at conception. So maybe the lower self doesn't have a leg up or doesn't have first dibs on the conversation. So he addresses this right here. This is a bit of a Talmudic analysis back and forth. You know, he's, he's he, he, he has a premise that we already did last time. He's questioning it. And now he's gonna question the question and answer the question to leave the question standing. I hope that makes sense, right? So his question is, who says the higher self is stronger? The higher self is younger. The, the, the lower self has been in there for 13 more years. Now, to forewarn an, an objection, the Talmud and also the cited Midrash and Noah do declare, so these sources do actually state that the soul, the godly soul, the higher self is given to man, that should be to man, is given to man, to humankind at the time of conception. Aha, so it is conception. So maybe they're equally matched. They each come in at the time of, I'm sorry, conception is early, early, earlier than birth, right? So we said that the lower self comes in at the time of birth. The time, the first cry of a child is, I want this, I want that. Fine, which is, again, we're not judging it as bad, but it's just, it's, it's instinctive. And so that's the lower self. 
And the, the higher self only comes in 13 years later, bar bat mitzvah. Okay, sure. And by the way, as we've discussed, right? You don't necessarily need the party, but it's good to have the party. Um, it's, it's an objective at, at the age of maturity. That's when it happens. Um, we, whether or not we had a, a, a DJ. But back to the story, over here, there's another, the other sources that say, no, the higher soul, the godly soul is given to the person at the time of conception, which is nine months before birth. So maybe the higher self, that's the older force inside. Okay, so let's continue. See Manakuna there. But this, let's go all the way to the next page, 196. This refers to it merely being given, but not to its effectiveness, which begins at 13. In other words, the soul, the godly soul, the divine soul, the higher self is earmarked for the child, for that human being. But it's not actually integrated with the person until around the age of 13. The claims of the eight Sahara, the lower self, then do precede those of the eight Tov, the higher good inclination. So he's back. It's back to the question, back to the question. If we have these two forces inside and they're battling, they're battling. And we said before that one folly is to say, look, I don't have the power. I don't have the energy keeping, keeping that arm, the mechanical arm up. I just can't, I can't hold it back. It's too strong. It's pushing too strong. We're just opening up the arm. We're opening up the gates. That's it. Come on through whatever you want. Come on through. I can't, I can't close it. Right. We said, no, that's a folly. That's a mistake. You can close it. You have the strength. He's asking now who says Right, that force, the lower self that put that's pushing, right, is in longer, has more of a voice inside than the arm that's trying to hold it back, than the God, than the higher self. And even though the higher self is earmarked at conception, earmarked is one thing, right, but influencing is another thing, and that only happens at the age of majority. Let's continue. Not only is this true on a spiritual level, but this is true of the body as well. Bodily, listen to this. In other words. The physical body is trained to what earlier? Food or meditation? <laughs> Food. That's it. That's what he says. Black and white. Like straight up. This is true of the body as well. Bodily gratifications like food, drink, and the light are immediate to the child. He's accustomed to them. And the habit is deeply ingrained. Again, there's nothing wrong with this. This is not a bad thing. He's just saying it's a thing. The lower self, which is all about self-preservation and ego and right, all of that is ingrained in the body itself. Muscle memory, right? If his environment encourages gross satisfactions. So in other words, if, if the atmosphere, if the environment in which one is brought up is not just about eating when you're hungry, but it's about like indulgence in material stuff, then, then, then this even more, then, sorry. If his environment encourages gross satisfactions beyond what's necessary, this is even more true and his undesirable or evil habits become embedded in him. As it says in, where's this footnote 238? As it says in Tanya, okay? Habit becomes nature, or at the very least, second nature. Most difficult to escape. So what happens is, he's saying, that for the first you know, many number of years, and maybe even, you know, as we're older also, even after 12 and 13, we train ourselves and our bodies to respond to what we want or what, what we need and even what we want or maybe what we don't even, you know, just straight up uh, luxury and, and, and decadence beyond what we need, beyond what's necessary. The example that I always give is the example of the difference between going out to a restaurant and going to the gas station, right? In both cases, what's happening primarily is fuel for the, is fuel. So you're fueling up your car, you're fueling up your body. The problem is no one ever, not the problem. No one ever took a selfie while filling up. Like, take a look, 93. Like, that's not a thing. Like, no one does that. Why? Because it's a very utilitarian, it's very pragmatic, it's very like practical. I need gas, I need to go somewhere else, filling up. So I'm moving on. But for some reason, the food experience is like this whole, whole romantic experience, this whole relationship. It's like this, the way it looks, the way it is. I'm not suggesting that we eat only bland foods, but we make it into this whole thing that then takes on a life into itself. But the point over here is that we're just training ourselves in ways of physical indulgence and material attachment. And the spiritual stuff, the higher stuff, we sometimes neglect a little bit, or at least it, it, it doesn't have the, the most immediate and first say in our lives. 
the first and most immediate voice is that of the lower self, and we train the body in that way as well, etc. But that's why we were yesterday about the most unique to counteract that, right? Right. Which is which is straight up where we're going with this. But his question, and he's formulating a question here, is one second, who says that we actually have the ability to undo all of that training? Maybe it's so early on in the spiritual and physical systems that maybe it's just, it's always going to be our default. Maybe that force of the animal that, and remember the animal is not, the animal's not evil, but it can end up doing vicious things, right? When the animal feels threatened, it lashes out, right? So it's like it's a human reaction. We feel threatened and we might get angry and lash out and hurt someone else, you know, for whatever it is, because we're feeling what we're feeling. And, and we're, and the whole premise of this, of this book is no, we can be in control. We can keep that arm down and not let it through because this, the arm is stronger than the, than the force. And he's saying, who says that force has a lot of history and a lot of training and a lot of, um, a lot of reps, right? It's, it's, it's been, it's, we've done that. We've, we've done that so many times. And how many times have we done this? How many times have we put that arm down? You know? Most of the time we let it through. So maybe based on nature and the way we've been, I'm using this a little bit differently than usual, based on the nature, the spiritual nature itself, and based on our nurturing of self, maybe that is more, maybe we, maybe we can't control it anymore. Don't worry. <laughs> it's going to end off on a good note, but this is the question. Okay, let's continue inside third paragraph 196. The godly soul has not had an opportunity to settle within him yet. And knows that at a younger age, the godly soul doesn't yet, doesn't say he doesn't have a godly soul. You got a godly soul from the beginning, right? It's here, but it's not settled. It's not integrated. It's like, it's like an outer, it's not small wonder, he says, that the animal soul is so much stronger than the godly soul, or it feels so much stronger than the godly soul. But what do people get more excited about? Like viscerally, like practically, a stay, a good steak, or, uh, you know, meditation, a mitzvah, Torah study. I mean, it's, right? if we're speaking, speaking real and honestly, people get more physically excited about the physical stuff, right? So small wonder, again, that the animal soul is so much stronger, at least at first glance, than the godly soul, and is properly called old king. That's why it's the old. It's been there for a while, and it's a king, it's, which connotes strength. His claims are earlier. He dominates all, sorry, he dominates in all the body's affairs. And as a veteran, listen to this, experienced in enticing and persuading people to pursue gross physical matters. In other words, it's not just it had the first voice. It's not just we've trained our bodies so much to follow that voice over the years. But it's it, at this point, it knows exactly the buttons to press to get us to do those things. The godly soul is a mere child in comparison to its opponent, and labors under another handicap for which he is called poor. And that is, his purpose is spiritual. While man, attracted to the material and accustomed to worldly grossness, regards spiritual matters rather miserably. In other words, what's, what are they selling? Yeah, I mentioned this a moment ago. What are they selling? The lower self, the animal soul is selling indulgence, pleasure, money, Wealth, fame, like all that stuff, all the physical stuff. And what's the God they're still selling? Purpose, meaning, you know. Hard work. Hard work. Material things matter to man. There is wealth and importance. Of course, the animal soul is stronger, he says. So it's extremely baffling then. Where does the godly soul get the vigor, get the energy, the strength to overcome its formidable opponent? We're saying that you have the ability and you have to believe in the ability that you have to control yourself. Who says? Who says? It seems by all accounts, if we're doing a critical analysis, the animal souls there earlier, it has more of a voice. It's more appealing, right? It's an easier sell. It's an easier sell. Just look at commercials. What are they selling? Yeah, you watch a football game. What are they selling? I don't know. Pizza, wings, beer, right? They're selling the, the physical stuff, huh? They're singing, all, they're also selling, um, you know, like the gambling stuff on the games. They sell like the DraftKings or whatever it is. That's what they're selling. They're selling money and indulgence. And 
Yeah. How many meditation, I guess, if middle of a football game, whatever, but like, it's, it's just an easier sell. We're physical human beings. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that the, the great Hasidic master, Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Abraditchev once said, he lived a few hundred years ago. He turned to, he was known as the great advocate of, uh, of the Jewish people. He was like, he always found like a justification and turned to God and said, God, take it easy. Like, you gotta understand how people operate. So he said like this, God, you have to, you have to put everything in context. You stack the deck against us. You put all the worldly pleasures right in front of our eyes. And you put all the spiritual values in the books on the shelf. If you did it the other way, everything would be different. Imagine if you put all the spiritual delights in front of us and put the physical indulgence in a book. You have to read about, oh, so that's what, that's what a, a good smoked, you know, uh, uh, steak is. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah, and all the spiritual purpose, meaning meditation values like mitzvahs, Torah, was in front of us. It would be a different, a different equation, but that's the way it is. But he, but he's asking an actual question. The question is, it seems that objectively, the lower self, the animal nature, the body's nature, the body's instinct is stronger than the soul's instinct. So maybe we don't have that ability. Even though it's commercial, even though it's commercial, it's both of them are a thing. But still, money is still motivating right right well hold on it's funny that you say that but don is pointing out that sometimes i mean we don't want to be too single but sometimes the um the companies that that are about doing good but are like if you buy a pair of shoes we'll send another pair of shoes again it's not a knock against any specific company but a lot of that is an actual technique marketing technique yeah. to get to get sales and to build business there's a there's a phrase for it that th that that was big. I mean, it's still big, but it's called um, whatever. It's it's basically you go to business seminars and they'll say find an angle, yeah. right? Find the charitable angle, and that's going to be another way to promote your business or whatever. So you're right. It's it's a, it's also driven by a little bit of stuff, but at least it's good, right? At least at the end of the day, good is happening. So it's not it's not too bad. Say it again. Something like that. And maybe a different phrase that I'm familiar with, but. Doesn't ring that. That's not exactly what I remember, but something along those lines. Anyway. So I have something. Yeah. So maybe I'm oversimplifying it. So I, I use my nephew, myself, and my sister for example. Okay. So I have a two year old nephew. I'm beating on shoes with him. All right. So candy sticks, all that stuff like that. They literally put this in the house. Right. He's grown up, never touching it. Right. Totally based on parents. Right. So why not just teach children from a, from a, from birth to ministry? You know. I'm with you. Right. Darren's asking the question. Hold on. If we're talking about the the facts of, of youth and training, so let's just train in a spiritual way. You're right. I mean, ideally, yes, but it's, you know, we live in a world where at the end of the day, the materialism dominates. But I'm with you. I'm with you. You train your body to eat certain things and you throw something else in there. The system's gonna gonna reject that. It's gonna it's gonna shut it down, right? It's gonna it's gonna mess up the system. It's like it's like actually putting the regular gray gasoline in a highly sophisticated engine, or maybe even more precisely, throwing gasoline into a Tesla. You may just totally mess up that. It's just a different system. The way. So could you do that? You Theoretically, yes. But on a practical level, most people are not on that level. Well, I know I'm doing all of this, but to me, it just seems like maybe the issue is not with like God or creating society a certain way. It's that the society is sick, right? As opposed to the, the higher self, or the, the higher and the lower self, it's just more necessary to feed the lower self. More than we grew up in monasteries, you know, I guess right. they would probably cater more to the higher self. You know? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point, right? So, like, if, if the context was different, you might have a different result. But I think that even in, uh, even in a, what we would call, like, a higher context, you would still have, you would still have some element of, and a strong element of self, of ego, of, of, of bodily need. And some of that is objective. So I think part of it, some of it is nature. Some of it is that nurture. So the nurture, you could try to neutralize a little bit, but the nature is still, there's still going to be a nature there that, that, that feeds body in, in one way or another. And so the question here is certainly given the, the, the majority of the world that most people live in, it seems very difficult to, to fight against that lower self. But, but I, I don't disagree with you. 
Right. In other words, sometimes the context doesn't eliminate uh, base desire or whatever it is. I'm, I'm not uh, you know, worse than base desire, right? Very. Okay. Fine. And again, that, that would open up another. Okay. Let's continue inside and let's, let's, let's go now to a spiritual. Oh, we're right at the time. So I want to do a little bit more. Toe and Tikkun, the spiritual worlds of, of chaos and, 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 and repair. And then we'll close it out. The problem is even more apparent when we explore the origins of these two souls. In other words, the animal and godly souls, the lower and higher selves. What are their spiritual origins? The animal soul is rooted in tohu. What's tohu? Not tofu. What's tohu? Tohu is, tohu is the spiritual world of chaos. While the godly soul 198 is rooted in tikkun, the world, spiritual world of repair, which is on a lower plane than tohu. So what is chaos? Chaos is that primordial world where the light was big and powerful and the vessels were small. And the vessels, the light shattered the vessels because of their strength, right? Tikkun is the light is small, the vessels are larger, and the light can rest in the vessel without a problem. So the the, the energy of, of Tohu, and I'm gonna we're gonna start next week's class, please God, with it with, with by focusing on Tohu and Tikkun and, and this idea. So I just want to do it quickly now and close it out, and then next week we'll pick it up and then run from there. Tohu is. Imagine like a chaotic space where, like imagine emotionally chaotic, where the, the emotions are so big, like big love or big fear or big whatever, like just big, powerful emotions, too big for a person to contain. And it just, it just causes havoc, right? It just causes havoc. It just breaks things down because the emotion is too big. So that's the idea of, of I mean, it's a spiritual realm, but that's an example of the, of the world of Toh. Tikkun is, the vessel, the containers are big, so to speak, and the light is small. So everything is settled and everything can be contained. Bottom line is tohu is bigger than tikkun. And it says that the animal soul comes from tohu, from this big energy space. And the godly soul comes from tikkun, which is the lower energy space. It is written in Genesis, these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before a king ruled over the children of Israel which represents the seven primordial kings of Tohu that preceded Tikkun. Seven, of course, refers to the seven emotional character dispositions of the soul, which I, I referenced very briefly earlier, right? The soul is comprised of three intellectual powers and seven emotional, plus the three garments of the soul, that's something else, but the soul itself has seven emotional traits. The ones that are of Tohu quality are the chaotic quality are the ones that are typically associated with the animal soul, and that seems to be stronger. So the ability of the godly soul to master the animal soul is all the more puzzling when you think about their, spirit, their respective spiritual origins. The animal soul comes from this powerful, chaotic space, and the godly soul comes from a, an organized and orderly space where the light is cut and light is drained, the light is limited. It's like big ideas or, you know, they fit into the, into the space. It's like water from a from a, um, a fire hose, powerful, or, you know, when you open up a sink and a, and, and a small, small flow of, of water comes out. It's different flows of energy. Tohu, the world of chaos, is big. So it exploded the vessels, which we'll speak about next week a little bit. Tikkun is a smaller flow of light, of energy. That's where the godly soul comes from. So if the, K, if the truth is that the animal soul is essentially more powerful than the godly soul, then how do we stand the chance? That's the question as we ask today. Now, I, I really hate ending on a question, especially a question of this, of this gravity of like, do we actually have control over self? I'll give you the short answer. The, the short, answer is, short answer is yes. How do we explain it given the evidence to the contrary? Come back next week as we explore this. What is the power of the godly soul? And what we're going to do is we're going to establish that in its source of sources, the godly soul is indeed higher than the animal soul. And that gives us the ability to control. But all of this we will flesh out next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Okay, let me check in with our online crew. Questions or comments? Questions or comments? No? Okay, good. All right, as long as all is clear. Quick announcements um, of stuff that's upcoming. What is the announcement? Okay, number one, got to get my bearings here. We got a lot of stuff coming up. So number one, okay, first and foremost, tomorrow night. Well, tomorrow we're meeting in person for Daily Power Parsha and Pichi Parsha. So that's 12 o'clock noon upstairs right here for lunch or online on Zoom. Um, tomorrow night, though, we are launching 
the brand new Rosh Chodesh series, Rosh Chodesh Society series called Well Connected. It's all about the spirituality of Jewish ritual. So Jew Judaism has a lot of ritual. And oftentimes the ritual can seem like very rote, like, oh, I got to do this and that. It's very mechanical and, you know, like soulless. Whereas when you study Kabbalah, you realize, one second, this ritual that seems very manual is so deep and so meditative. This course, it's a monthly course for women, by women, for women. So this course will focus on every month, one mitzvah, one Jewish ritual and explore its mystical side as a special I don't know if it's a bonus. I'm not going to call it a bonus. As a special treat, we are having at the first session, which is going to be on the mitzvah mezuzah, the scroll that goes on the wall, right? On the, on the doorpost. The first session we will be having for the in-person group, a glass, sorry, a fused glass mezuzah case workshop. So you'll create your own custom fused glass mezuzah case. We're not, we don't have a kiln here, so we'll create the we'll create the glass, send it off to the kiln, and then we'll have it ready at some later point for you to enjoy, and you can use it for your own mezuzah in your own house on the door of your house, whichever door you prefer. That's going to be an additional bonus to the first session for the in-person crew. So that's tomorrow night, uh, November fifteenth. You can check out more in slash rcs We also have upcoming. What else do we have? Oh, Saturday night. With Donna, jewelry, Hanukkah jewelry, Hanukkah jewelry workshop. So for you or for someone you love, you have a chance to make custom, gorgeous boutique, artisan Hanukkah themed jewelry, along with the Hanukkah party right here, pre Hanukkah party, Saturday night, November 20th, 7.30 p.m. Get your latkes, get your donuts. So last year, the Hanukkah piece of the jewelry was, you know, very colorful and fun donuts this year. Right. Menorah in the window, it's all about bringing light. Yeah, and then dreidel. Yeah, and then we have a blue, black pearl gemstone, which reflects how the menorah is shining a light in this. Right, into, into those spaces that need to be illuminated. Beautiful. All right, so as, as Donna, I don't know if you guys could hear it, as Donna just mentioned, the theme of the jewelry is about illumination, is about bringing light out. That's why we light the menorah in the window so as to brighten up our world outside. It's not just about keeping the light inside. It's about sharing the light and illuminating the darkness. This is what we have Saturday night. Beautiful jewelry. You want to be part of it. Again, you could join in person or online. We can send you kits or you can pick it up, but join us in person because you can't eat the donuts virtually. It's not going to far bringing? Is there a far bringing tonight? Is there a far bringing tonight? Uh, there might be somewhere. I'm not sure. There's a far bringing... There's a for well, so there's a few things. Um, there's a few things. And tonight, if the question is about tonight, I'm not sure about tonight. Next week, though, we are having a everyone is invited to join us 12:30 for Meals of Hope. So after Kabbalah and Coffee, join us for Kabbalah and Coffee, then join us in person for Kabbalah and Coffee, and then in person for Meals of Hope. Although you come after the class, where we're we'll, we will be cooking for Rebecca's tent which is a shelter for women without homes in the community. It's uh, they do amazing work and we're going to be cooking meals for them next Sunday. You know the menu? Uh, yeah, I made the menu. You want to know the menu? Oh, we're going to be making amazing food. Are you kidding me? We're going, we're going all out on this. Yes. Yes. Well, that's perfect setup. You ready? Okay. We're going to be, this is on the menu. Artisan breads, potato, mushroom, barley soup, Caesar salad, salmon, roasted potatoes, asparagus, fresh fruit, and brownies. So the kabod cooks it, it's totally high class. This is, uh, this is, this is the meal. We're doing a, 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 an elaborate meal. So join us. We need help. The shopping we're good with. We, we're going to get all the stuff this week. We have it taken care of. But for the actual cooking and prepping, the actual like hands-on with the food, join us 1230 to cook food. Like cooking class too. Also, also, yeah. But the main thing is to, to help to prepare, to, to make a warm meal for those that need a warm meal. So that's ha happening um, mitzvah day, IJ mitzvah day next week, 12.30 p.m. And stay tuned for more exciting announcements. You may have received an announcement. You might still receive an announcement. 
of, uh, of upcoming stuff. So stay tuned for that and more that is upcoming. Okay, that's all the news. Sounds like too many announcements already for me to keep track of. If you want to know what's going on, just check out the website. You can always join. If you have any questions, reach out to me and I can help. Okay. See y'all. Have a wonderful day. Stay healthy.